stacking surfer. The like can't become your best friend. Balances in your bank and stack. All right, everybody, welcome to the channel today. I've got um, a great guest here, Lior Gantz, and he is from the Wealth Research Group, and um, their website is wealthresearchgroup.com. And I'm excited to have him here today because he's got some great insight into what's happening in world markets, um, especially around gold and silver. Um, and then he also has done a lot of research, and hence the name, um, that I think we can all benefit mm -hmm. from. Um, in, in Lior, one of the things, welcome to the channel, by the way. Um, you, one of the things that I that I love about watching when I'm, um, I love watching videos that you are uh, you are speaking in is that you, you help us start to put a foundation together um, based on, on facts and what's going on out there. Um, you know, I've done a couple polls on my channel where when it, where I'll ask people, is silver going to $30 before it goes down to $25? And I can very well read my, uh, my audience's sentiment and where things are going. And sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. And so we do tend to have a lot of emotional status going on in our, in our community where people see the upward momentum and they think it's never going to correct, or they see the downward momentum and they think it's never going to go back up. And so I'd love to understand a little bit more where you see the markets going today. And, um, and you know, are we in for a $3,000 gold? Like I hear from many people by the end of the year. And, um, you know, the other thing I hear is, are we going to get back to a $50 silver or are we all in a getting ready for a world of disappointment where we're going to see gold go below 2000 again? and silver down below 20. Um, what are your, what are your take, what's your take and what's your sentiment on where you think things may go and what could be the factors that um, would make a determination on which direction that might go? Um, I, in 2011, uh, the last time that gold and silver had a, a real big blow off top, okay. uh, everything looked and felt uh, so much different than okay. where it is right now. And that that is an important consideration for me. Um, you know, when, when, you, when you hear a lot of people just talking about gold and silver, um, and, and when you see a lot more mainstream coverage of gold and silver, that tends to mean that it's become mainstream. And okay. those are the latest stages of a bull market today, you have gold trading over 2,500. Nobody blows a whistle um, on, on CNBC. You know, you'd be hard pressed to see uh, any coverage of it, let alone silver. So to me, um, this is a, is better than any technical or fundamental or, or anything else that I may conjure up in my mind, whether, you know, about like Trump or Kamala or, or Russia or Israel, all these things that you can, build these scenarios and setups and, and scripts in your mind. Uh, at the end of the day, um, the best indicator, uh, at least in precious metals, is is coverage. Um, yeah. And, and, and uh, in general, uh, another thing that you can do is, uh, on top of polling is call the brokers, the, the uh, bullion dealers, and ask them about um, buying and selling. Uh, they'll tell you if there's more buyers and sellers in their in, in their shops, or if there's rush, if people are lining up uh, outside the you know the door. These are real world um, indicators. Um, plus, silver is nowhere near an all time high, so yeah. to me, it's it's kind of hard to uh, ring the bell on this bull market with with that being the case. Um, it, on top of that. Just to wrap this up, fundamentally, um, you know, gold bottomed on December fifteenth of twenty fifteen at uh, around eleven hundred. It it went back up to around eighteen hundred and then pulled all the way back to twelve hundred in September twenty eighteen. But then something very important happened in September of twenty eighteen, and then something really important happened April twenty nineteen. It became a tier one asset, and yep. that. That really changes what gold is um, to governments, to sovereign wealth funds, to pension funds, to central banks. Um, it's a it's a real big change, um, and to me, uh, that means a lot about how much more uh, can can um, 
happen here. The, the, keep in mind, gold at the end of the day is a derivative of um, other things. It, its price is determined uh, by the mining cost to a degree, but it's more about the premium above the mining cost. And, and that premium is a derivative of everything else that's going on in the world, specifically uh, real interest rates and their trajectory, their direction. And real interest rates are inflation minus real rates. And the, the world's biggest trauma right now is inflation. Yep. And counterintuitively, what that means is that as inflation is coming down, that trauma of, of uh, uh, we don't want to see inflation will keep interest rates higher than inflation. And that means that we have negative uh, real rates in the economy or or uh, the intention to create negative real rates. And that's really good for gold. So let, let's talk about that for just a second, too. So um, th there's a couple things that I hear out there in the marketplace. Um, they're not necessarily coming from the pundits or by the analysts. It's maybe more chatter that's out there. Um, and different channels, I, I've heard some of these things. Um, I've heard that we could potentially have a um, everything crash that comes up. I hear that we are seeing the S&P 500 get very uh, frothy. Um, at the same time, I hear other people, it's like I hear two different camps. Yeah. Um, you know, I hear people that say we're going to have a blow off top and then we're going to have a crash. I have other people saying, hey, it's just going to keep going. Um, a lot of people seem to be thinking that if the Fed lowers rates in Jan, sorry, a lot of people are thinking that if the Fed lowers rates in September, that we're off to a new QE session and then we're going to start seeing them lowering rates. Um, my opinion is that this is really more political. Um, it happens often when we have a presidential election cycle coming up. The rates may get a dip down prime, uh, uh, for a short period of time. Um, I don't know if the Fed may raise rates again or if we're going to see them hold for a much longer period of time. Um, but what are the risks that we run into with that interest rate going down? Um, well, the risk to me is that interest rates stay uh, where they are. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's way too restrictive. Um, there, there's no reason in the world to be at 525 at a fund rate. It should be a percentage lower. Now, they're not going to cut by one percentage, but they're, they should start to think about going back to four, uh, three and a half to four. That That's um that's what the economy uh will do best the the u.s economy is booming and it could boom a lot more um uh, because there's so much innovation um demographics yeah. looks uh, look real good in the united states compared to many other countries the the millennials are having families they're they're going to spend a lot on housing there's a massive construction boom that's going to happen um you, you probably need between three to five million in homes that's a lot uh in the next decade so between all of that um and just the biggest driver is deglobalization um for 30 years um there was a fantasy that um after the berlin wall fell that america can uh sacrifice its middle class and in for in exchange buy friends around the world specifically mm -hmm. china and and in Russia and everybody will hug it out just like uh, East and West Germany. But uh, it, it's not that that fantasy blew up. Um, but a lot of people, um, you know, still live that fantasy up until um, the virus. The, the, the COVID really made um, uh, think tanks change their course. And okay. then Russia invaded um, Ukraine and really punched that entire theory of globalization in the face. There is no globalization uh, in the way that, that was constructed after the 90s. It, it's it's done. We are going back into deglobalization, and therefore America needs to shore up um, a lot of the industries that it, it gave up. It needs to become more independent, um, and it will be more independent. And, and I think that that will drive a lot of GDP growth. And when I say a lot of GDP growth, I mean three, three and a half percent, which is far higher than the two um, that we've seen for many decades, for the last yeah. two decades. And that, you know, that translates to another hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars per family 
um, every generation. I mean, that's big money. So on, on an aggregate scale, right, for a country, all of that tells me that between the 35% decline uh, crash that we had in March 2020 and then the 33% decline that we had in 2022, the markets have already given up two major bear markets, uh, one after the other. I, I don't see a blow off top and I don't see an, ever, uh, an everything crash. Um, I, 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 th- I, I think this is way more uh, analogous to, um, to great bull markets that are just expanding. Um, so t- to me, that's where we are. We, we, we have more um, to go for, for the markets, um, certainly for the stock market, in my opinion. Um, and, and, you know, I, I walk the talk, look at my portfolio. I mean, it's just, just download it yourselves and check it out. It's wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash portfolio. You can literally see it. And I, I'm not afraid to invest in stocks right now at all. Um, okay. So t- to me, we are in a bull market that's just going to expand. Um, and when I mean expand, it, it expands from the Magnificent Seven taking 30% of the yeah. The S and P five hundred. That's a that's a a big chunk, um, and, and I think that will that will shrink because the other companies will start to do better in uh, more normalized interest rate environment. And as the economy um, starts to look better, there's six point two trillion dollars, six point two trillion in money market accounts. That's a lot of uh, idle uh, funds sitting out there. That that's that's an all time high. No. I, I, I think that's interesting. And I, I, I'm seeing a lot of different opinions about that. Um, you know, according to what you're saying in the market too, I've noticed with the company I even work with that's publicly traded, um, we had some good news come out and all of a sudden the stock took like a, a 20% increase almost overnight. So right yeah. now, I think there's some big opportunity for people that, um, you know, not trying to play the market per se. I don't recommend that. I always look at dollar cost averaging and looking at the fundamentals of the company. Um, but we're, we seem to be at a point in time where you can have some good news that really does, um, you know, help a stock go up and you can take advantage of that. And to your point, I, I have read that there's a lot of cash that's there. Um, where do you, where do you see that cash going? Do you see that going into, um, into spe- specific markets or into specific, um, industries? I don't know. I think, uh, t- to be honest, I-, I think that the retail public that that's right now in money market accounts, I think it's a bubble. And I think that the, mm-hmm. they'll wait until the last second to get okay. their money out of cash. I, I think that the, the, the Fed will start to cut rates and then they'll they'll do nothing. Um, they'll stay there. They'll stay there and they'll stay there until the yield on money markets goes from five to three to two. And then they'll they'll pull it out last minute. It's a it's a cash bubble. That's what's interesting. Yeah, here. That is interesting. Because because think about it. Yeah. Inflation was the issue yep. what is the worst place you can put your money in inflation it's in a money market account that's literally losing money by by definition that is the retail um medium right now so well, it, it, when in, to your point earlier when you look at real um real interest rates the real rate of return it, it's it's always well below what they're paying out of money markets yes um well, just think the money market account, the 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 issuer of the money market, he uses those funds and lends them out at higher rates. So yep. <clears throat> you can you can see how that works. Um, I just recently um, uh, put put money in in, in a debt fund that, that yields twelve percent, and then they called me and they said it's the last week if you want to increase, otherwise it's going to ten percent. So yields are coming down. Mm. Um, already. And I think that uh, um, mortgage rates will come down. A lot of people that have been sitting outside will start buying homes. So I think that if you're asking me where that money market account uh, funds will go, yeah. I don't think it will go to investments. I think they will they will go to start buying homes, which are not investments, but that's where I think they will go. So for people to live in, they're personal residences. Yes. Yes. Okay. Starter homes. Yeah. Starter homes. Well, they're going to need the cash because things are a lot more expensive <laughs> than they were a few years ago. Yes. So correct. maybe, you know, maybe the last thing to kind of ask you on today is this. Um, when we look at, you know, if we go down and, and take a look at your portfolio, 
Um, what kind of a direction or advice would you give people that are uh, stackers today? So they, they hold precious metals. Um, you know, just about everybody that I know is watching has silver. And then we have a handful of people and maybe a pretty good chunk of them that have gold as well. Um, is this something that you would recommend um, increasing, um, you know, the rate of what they're, what they're adding to their stack, maybe decreasing or maybe holding? Or what are some of the indicators that you would that you would recommend they take a look at to help them make those decisions? So I think um, that most of your uh, viewers do not have um, what I have in terms okay. of the strategy. The, and, and it's funny because I'm not I'm not a stacker okay. or a big or a big gold and silver like fanatic, um, but uh, my strategy is to have um, two years worth of my living expenses. I love that. Okay. Converted into physical gold. Okay. So just to give you an example uh, and to, to make it simple and rounded, let's say the family burn rate is $5,000 a month. Okay. And that you times that by 24, it's $120,000. You convert that to physical gold. That to me, uh, that's an open and shut uh, setup. And if if you have that notion that there will be a day when all your income streams will dry up, when your job is not safe, or et cetera, et cetera, you take you take that thought process, you go into the to the doom, and you say two years, two years worth of my current living expenses, I have. In physical gold, I think that's enough, right? I mean, uh, I, that is a I, I that it. is a yeah. that is a zero COVID policy. Your doors are being yes. you know, bolted down, etc. <laughs> so, that, to me, that's enough. Um, and then uh, silver. So, to me, silver because that's gold. That's physical gold. Yep. To me, silver um, is much more of a of a trade than a holding. Uh, it it far underperforms over the long term compared to gold. Just the, that's statistics. You're that's statistics facts, guys, yeah. right? Um, and then I think that th the way you do it right with silver is you use silver to your advantage. And that means that there will be a time in this bull market where silver will start to go. And when it starts to go, it will go up by you know, 30 to 50 to 70% in months. And in that time, you need to be able to, to do something smart and, and and trade in and out either of options or, you know, uh, leverage ETFs, silver stocks, gold stocks, etc. That to me is more of the uh, the way I go with, with silver. And in general, I don't let any of these become more than 5 to 10% of the entire net worth because the rest uh, should be uh, elsewhere. So, so yeah, I, I think you've put some very good points there. So I'll just kind of round that up a little bit too with, with add some of my own thoughts to it. Um, one, uh, I like the idea of having some long-term food storage and water storage in addition to expenses. So one of the things that I, I'm in Israel and we don't even go there, but I yeah. know you guys don't go there. But with with my with my with my background and the culture I've grown up in and, and kind yeah, of my yeah. religion, we we've always been taught from a young age to have a year supply of food. Well, that's that's been good. something we've kind of grown up with. So um, part of my philosophy is a year supply of food, um, and we're talking you know long term food storage that you can rotate. You can also do it in a shorter stance. Really, the most important thing is probably about two to to four weeks worth if there's a major catastrophe you usually in let you know even here in california if we have a massive massive earthquake that goes on within a month you're going to have sure. food dropping out of the sky so this is more for yeah. a a situation of not catastrophe but to the point that you're bringing up you may not have income for two years and now you've got some food security in addition to that i love the idea of having a minimum of a year supply of expenses i love 24 months even more than 12 months and to your point, I agree. Um, to me, gold is wealth insurance. It's there to shore up things like property taxes for me. It's there to, um, you know, like you said, take care of those expenses that, that could come in. And you have a stable instrument um, that's doing that that is 
most of the time going up in value. However, you may buy at some peaks. So, it, you know, you are going to have some ups and downs. Silver, I, I tend to do in two different re ways. One is a trade for me. Um, I do go to coin shows and I have a booth and I sell. So it is a side business for me. Um, it's an income stream. And then on the other side, I have some that stays primarily constitutional silver in case there is an SHTF where we could potentially barter. But that's really something that I buy, I forget, and I leave in a safe, and it, it may just be passed to my kids. So it's another form of a little bit of savings. Um, but to your point, gold and silver are not investments in the true sense that I look at. It doesn't produce yield. Um, it doesn't have the kind of growth potential that, it, that I see with companies or with real estate. Those are the investments I like to go into for my wealth. Um, as far as a percentage, it all depends. For me, I kind of fluctuate between three and maybe 20% at the very most. Um, but it depends on the situation I'm in and everybody's case is going to be a little different. Um, and it, it depends. I'm in California, so I tend to be a little bit higher on some of the more secure things because the cost of living is so high here. I have to cover a higher amount. Um, I wish my outlay was 5000 a month. Let me put it that way. <laughs> That'd be mm. nice to get back to that. But Leo, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, for those of you that want to to see his portfolio and see what he's doing, go to wealthresearchgroup.com and take a look at that. And Lior, I'd love to have you on again. I'd love to set up some time for us to chat a little bit more too on some Absolutely. of the things we hit before the, the, um, uh, the video started, because I think there's some other cool angles that we could definitely hit that the stacking community is not even aware of yet that would be really interesting. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.